lost by 16 points on their home court to a very depleted Portland squad. And personally, I don't think you should care. It's simple. This is only the third month of the season and there was nothing to suggest that this loss was concerning. As always, this starts with the offensive playbook. You know who I am, but let's talk about it. On this inbounds pass, Tobias Harris comes around the Dwight Howard screen. But Seth sells the fake and Tobias takes his man to the corner. Meanwhile, Dwight sets himself up to initiate the inbounds pass. That's not an easy screen to get around either. Dwight's a roadblock in the on-ball defender's path. The action is as simple as giving your playmaker an opportunity to create in space. And I'd say Philly relies on these screens on close to 80-90% of their possessions. That's because the options are endless. You're playing a game within the game. So check this out. The defense is preparing for Korkmaz to clear these screens and either get downhill to the rack or hit a few spots. Kaner drops in coverage in anticipation of Korkmaz getting downhill, which makes Portland's defense more vulnerable. Dwight's a roadblock, and Kaner's too far deep in drop coverage to come anywhere near contesting this shot. It's not hard to tell why Philly uses these staggered screens with such high frequency. You're giving your playmakers the opportunities to create in space. For example, Tobias knows where his spots are, so he gets a head start to attack one, and the on-ball defenders just gotta play catch. Up. Think about it from a defensive perspective. You're pinned in the corner and you gotta fight around two screens and cut it up north to keep up with the dude that has the ball in his hands. So the ball handler can just manipulate coverage and hit his spots. Philly's not one dimensional either. You're probably safely assuming that Shake's gonna clear these double screens and do what we saw in the past couple plays. But watch how the Sixers break the game down. Tobias is gonna release to the wing. Joe, he's gonna roll to the basket. So a five on five right now is a three on three. But when Shake gets to that Embiid screen, a three on three becomes a two on two. Shake delivers an early decisive pass to Tobias and now a five on five is just a one on one. What's encouraging is that the system works. Everyone from the starting five to the bottom five can execute these actions. So what their offense look like outside of the playbook? The two man game remains a massive source of Billy's offense. Their pick and roll ball handlers have generated the seventh most points in the league there this year, whereas they've been bottom three in each season since 2015. There's no disadvantages. The ball handlers get these giant trees to navigate around so they can manipulate coverage and attack their spots. And it helps that the ball handlers can rely on one of the most dominant players in the league in Joel Embiid or Dwight Howard, who's shooting close to 60% on rolls to clean things up in the two-man game. Having these defined roles benefits everyone's game. The screeners understand when and where to screen. And for the ball handlers, they know where these screens are coming from and they know where their spots are. When the ball handler has that understanding, they can just play their game. They don't necessarily have to worry about creating a shot with their handles or tricks in their bag. Instead, they're actually thinking and doing less. It's just about hitting a spot in space. It's up to the screener to help create that space. Just watch how effective it is for the Sixers. Shake Milton, Tyrese Maxey, and Tobias Harris are three of 10 players around the league to score at least 90 points in the pick and roll on at least 50% shooting. The Clippers are the only other squad with more than one player on that list. Somehow, the Sixers missed every three-point attempt in the first half and still managed to give Joe the best spacing on the floor he's had in his entire career. And his canner, it's that time. He's coming for you. And we got an entire game of this child's play. Let's look at the spacing first. Joe gets four shooters around the perimeter and a one-on-one -on -one that starts 10 to 14 feet from the basket. To put into context how damaging that is for a defense, the only other spot on the floor where Joe's made more shots this season is within five feet of the basket. So in other words, that's a layup. The floor was so spaced out that Joe got these one-on-ones the entire night. Philly also uses their spacing to break a five-on-five -five game down. And oh no, he's coming for you. Tonight, Harry Giles, you get to go one-on-one -on -one with The Undertaker. Wait, did he just do the same thing in two straight possessions? Maxi tried to take his man away from the double, but Portland's not playing. Still, the Sixers can space the floor enough to essentially give their big dog four shooters around the arc. And with that space, get off me. You better be applying some serious pressure with your doubles. Joe patiently waits for Tobias to clear out and take away the double. That brings us to the money look that we all know and love. Three around the perimeter, one near the double. No, not Harry Giles again. Chill out, Joe. 
Did I just see that right? Let me find out Joe's cooking like that. Wait, he did it to Ennis Canner too? Oh my God, he did it off the dribble too. What? Oh my God. That's just not fair to do that at that height. The reason why role definition is invaluable is because the team understands who this offense runs through. It's Joel Embiid. So the players on the floor know what to do to optimize that. If Toby and Maxi didn't try to make the defense react and keep them honest, Joe would have been doubled so quickly on this play. In order to prevent that, the other four players on the floor worked to form the money look. Three around the perimeter, one near the dunker, and enough space to give Joe a Again? These one-on-ones aren't happening by accident. This is the most talented group, coaches, players that Embiid and Simmons have ever played with. And what do you think those shooters with gravity around the perimeter are gonna do for a grown man bucket getter that could score at any level? When Joe establishes his presence early and can get to his spots, he's unstoppable. Teams have no choice but to double him. If teams sell out and double Joe, the Sixers have to make him pay. Look at it from a courtside perspective. This is a mouse in the house. Joe's already at his spot in the block and he's way too good and way too big for Portland to stop that one-on-one. -on -one. Look at how much space that is. That's way more than you think from the wide shot TV perspective. It's like hypothetically with most defenses, if you can't send help here, you're not stopping Joe that deep. That's problematic, that's blood in the water. I tell you why the next few plays are so important, but coach did it for me on all the smoke with Matt Barnes and Stack. I'll let him tell you. What we have to do is get him comfortable with being double team and get him un to understand, uh, having the mindset, if you double team me, we're gonna score. Mm -hmm. If you don't double team me, we're gonna, gonna score. score. Right, and, and he has that mindset now, you can see it. Like Joe had a monster game, but negative game script early affected him and Tobias Harris. And the loss of Ben Simmons didn't help anybody. In fact, it actually hurt. We're not gonna talk about it, we're gonna act like it didn't happen, but whew, the basketball gods had Joe's back in this one. Joe scored 31 points by halftime, which marked a league-leading seventh game where he scored at least 20 points in the first half. He finished with 37 points over the double? on 66% shooting. Tobias did what he always does. He plays his game, but game script explains his quiet night. The Sixers were feeding Joe every possession in the second quarter, which took away from Tobias's game, but also he didn't have Ben with him. And see, Ben is more important than people care to admit. Two things here. Either Ben's getting that rebound, or he's getting the pass from Dwight where Danny Green is. CJ Ellaby is defending Danny Green, and he gets down the court before Danny Green does. Danny Green eventually gets the ball, but Portland's defense can play everybody at the three-point line. That's where Ben could collapse the defense and take attention off of his teammates. There was usually only one player over 6'8 on the floor for Portland last night. If Ben Simmons at 6'10 gets downhill here with a mismatch, the baseline or the help defense fully commits. They don't retreat to close out in the corner. That's why his assisted three pointers are so valuable. The Sixers score an average of 13 fast break points per game when Simmons is on the floor compared to just five when he's off. Not only was the pace lower in this game, but the Sixers only assisted a total of six three pointers. Ben Simmons alone averages four assisted three point makes a game. Ben Simmons would be three, four steps ahead of Danny Green here, and the defenders would be drawn to him in transition. This would likely leave two green light shooters trailing with wide open three point shots. If you think I'm reaching, then watch the film. Go get educated. Ben Simmons doesn't lead the league in assisted three point makes by accident. He accelerates past everybody and pushes pace off a live rebound. He makes it a three on three numbers game and look at where all of the defensive attention is. The attention that he draws leaves two trailing green light shooters open on the wings and he does this like five or six times a game. The weak side and the perimeter defense suffered. I mean, come on, if that's Simmons, he's blocking this. There was a plus 16 rebounding differential in favor of the trailblazers and they grabbed 19 offensive rebounds. Simmons is snagging that. If he didn't grab it, he probably would have fronted Canner here. Yes sir, Mello throwing dots in transition. Korkmaz had to front the big so he didn't hawk this pass down. But I guarantee that Simmons is in Trent's chest making things a little more complicated. Hopefully now you can appreciate and understand how impactful Ben Simmons is. Now that that's out of the way, let's look at the defense. I thought Joe played real good defense. One steal, one block, and only one foul committed. Altogether, Portland made just four of 14 attempts when defended by Joe. 
That's 28% from the field. He forced two turnovers, and despite what the analytics say about his defense in this game, having him there impacts the other team's entire offensive approach. Otherwise, a couple of things happen defensively. The Sixers went under screens a few times, which actually worked. Tobias met Covington at his spot and contested the three. DG went under the screen and prevented Gary Trent from getting a shot off at his spot. The Sixers went over a fair share of screens too, which inevitably led to Portland production. Similar to the Sixers offense, this screen forces the on-ball defender to fight around it. And meanwhile, the ball handler can just hit a spot or manipulate the coverage. And Portland wasn't playing around. They exploited that drop coverage coverage as often as they could. There was actually a play where Embiid hedged the screen. He checked Rock until DG could recover and take his man back, but then he went and dropped coverage. While that happened, Canner set an off-ball screen and Portland exploited the Sixers' drop coverage. The Sixers gave the ball away five times in the first half and missed all 10 of their three-point attempts then. It's a way different game if the Sixers open a little tighter. But I didn't watch this game and think the Sixers need to trade this or their flawed team here because of that. It just didn't happen. It was an off night. Every team's had one. It's a long season, man. It's a marathon. I've seen this team execute together. They're on the same page together and they're complimenting each other's games. The starters are undefeated together. I'm not worried. Look fam, that's it for me. I appreciate you hanging out with me. As always, I'll see you when I see you. I hope it's in the next one. But if not, hit me up with a sub, comment below, holler at me on Twitter. Do whatever you gotta do. But most importantly, stay solid, baby. Stay solid, baby! <laughs>